Corruption, payoffs, sweetheart deals, billions of dollars in taxpayer money wasted. What happens when wealthy businesses and special interests convince politicians to give them favors and deals? One of the world's greatest thinkers asked that same question 250 years ago. He was a Scotsman named Adam Smith, a moral philosopher, a bold voice of the Scottish Enlightenment and the world's first economist. Recorded his revolutionary ideas in two remarkable books, The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations. While a fan of free markets, Smith disliked crony capitalism and monopolies. Today we'll explore what he thought about companies considered too big to fail. Adam Smith was born in 1723 in the small seaside town of Kirkcaldy, Scotland, where he learned about morality and economics at the local merchant's market. He studied at Glasgow University, became its top administrator and then a pillar of the unlikely intellectual revolution called the Scottish Enlightenment. He was the father of economics and he lived in Great Britain. Eighteenth century London didn't have cars or buses, but it was a huge, vibrant metropolis and the center of the most important political debates. Smith followed them closely and he wrote about them in detail. As you read Smith, it becomes very clear that the problems of his day are very much similar to ours. Poverty and unemployment, failure in the educational system, political pork, foreign conflict, runaway spending and a burgeoning national debt. Some of that debt can be blamed on what was perhaps the greatest state-supported monopolistic company in history. Here along the Thames, in the southeast corner of London, lay the Docklands, home to those mighty fleets of sailing ships in the days when Britannia truly ruled the waves. This place doesn't look like much today, but in the early 19th century this was a bustling, wide expanse of docks and port facilities owned by the East India Company. This used to be the home port of one of the most powerful organizations on earth. Now it's just filled with mud. Smith saw the East India Company as the epitome of monopolistic evil. Britain's National Maritime Museum in Greenwich has the story. Here within the galleries of this World Heritage Site is an amazing repository of the seafaring heritage of the British Empire, filled with treasures large and small, including a superb exhibit of the East India Company. I think what surprises people when they come into um, this gallery is just A, how large the company was and B, how long it lasted. I mean, this is something that's dominating Asian trade for more, almost 250 years, essentially. Robert Blythe is the senior curator of world history here at the museum. The East India Company actually becomes an Asian power. It has its own army, its own navy, and of course its own merchant ships are armed as well. In fact, it was one of the most powerful organizations on earth. In Smith's day, the company accounted for much of the world's trade and had its own army of almost 70,000 soldiers. It ruled all of India. So the company is actually minting its own coinage in India in order to strike some of its deals. So an official coat of arms and minting your own coins, it seems like they're almost spontaneously without intention moving from being a company to becoming a government. Absolutely. This is monopoly. The company has real power. So this is company as government. The story of the East India Company highlights how easy it is to divert public resources for private gain. If you think of Adam Smith's ideas of a free market, of free trade, the company is the absolute antithesis of that. Smith denounced the company as a blood-stained monopoly, burdensome, useless and responsible for grotesque massacres in Bengal. Its managers and officers became incredibly wealthy, but the company itself was never very profitable. 
when it's not making a profit, when military conquest in India really is a drain on its finances, the British government has to step in to prop up the East India Company. Essentially, the company becomes too big to fail. In order to bail out the company, Parliament passed the Tea Act of 1773, allowing the company to sell its tea to the American colonies on privileged terms, at a tax rate lower than the local tea merchants. This, of course, led to the Boston Tea Party. So it is East India Company tea that is thrown into the harbour at Boston. Now, it might be too much of an exaggeration to say that the East India Company's monopoly caused the American Revolution, but definitely a factor in it. The colonies fought a desperate war for independence, and after many battles and the loss of many lives on both sides, the new nation was created. A nation with leaders who thought they had left the corruption of England's past behind. Unfortunately, some things never change. And the same issues that Adam Smith dealt with 250 years ago are still very much with us today. And the problem can be easily illustrated by taking a walk in the woods. In state and national parks all across the United States, you'll often find signs like this that say, please do not feed the animals. Because if you feed uh, the wild animals, they lose the ability to gather food in the wilderness. And as a result, they tend to be less resilient and their survival is at risk. Luigi Zingales is professor of entrepreneurship and finance at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. I think that a similar sign should be put in Washington to say, please don't feed business. Precisely because I love business, I don't want business to become fat and unable to compete in the global marketplace. Smith was very suspicious of partnerships between government and business. That's effectively what we call cronyism today. This is the result of feeding the animals Washington style. In recent years, housing values around the US capital have skyrocketed. There is no real industry, there is no real uh, uh, commerce, and it's pretty scary that uh, wealthiest counties in, uh, in the United States are in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. The top two richest counties in the United States and six of the top ten are suburbs of Washington, D.C. All that money is basically money that is sucked from the system and wasted uh, in lobbying. Lobbying pays very well, and not just for the lobbyists. The real payoffs go to the corporations they represent. Smith thought that any institution, government included, could become corrupted if it was too big and made too many decisions centrally. To widen the market and to narrow the competition is always the interest of the dealers. Any new law or regulation of commerce ought always to be listened to with great precaution. A series of recent governmental regulations illustrates Adam Smith's fear. Corn ethanol is a biofuel. It's basically fuel that comes from corn. It's more costly and far more inefficient to make than ethanol from sugar. But now, almost 40% of the nation's corn crop goes into making ethanol, which has driven the price of corn way up. It makes corn farmers and processors happy because it gives them a guaranteed profit. But all of us have to pay more for foods that use corn, especially meat and poultry. The fuel companies are required by federal law to buy ethanol, whether they want it or not, or whether motorists want it or not. Between 2007 and 2012, the corn ethanol lobby spent $139 million and in return gained over $28 billion in corn ethanol tax credits. So once you have this kind of returns, then people will not invest in uh, R&D, they will not invest in new sort of organizational form, they will not invest in new technology, they will not invest in new property planted equipment, they will invest in lobbying. Many corporations prefer to get their profits by legislating them, rather than by selling goods and services that people want on an open market. Adam Smith saw exactly the same forces at work in his day. What Smith saw was that when business people go to the government and they say, we want a special royal charter, we want special protections from competition, we are a vital national industry and we need special privileges, you got to be careful. Because when this happens, this is really people conspiring to protect their own interests at the expense of others. 
Adam Smith understands that in order for competition to work its magic, you need to have rules in place because otherwise, rather than competition, you have the law of the jungle. This is Adam Smith's key insight. Competition is not a way of giving power to companies. It's a way of giving us power over them. The Founding Fathers not only established a government of the people, by the people, for the people, they also established an economic system of the people, by the people, for the people. This is what distinguishes the United States from the rest of the world, and this is what gives us hope. Corruption and inside deals may always be with us, but we must strive to minimize them. Remember, Adam Smith believed that we should be pro-market, not pro-business, and we must be careful not to feed the animals. <laughs>